Welcome to the Indian Council of World Affairs, India's oldest foreign policy think tank. Many people interested in foreign policy have told me when they come to the Indian Council of World Affairs in Sapru House, they feel a great sense of affinity with this institution because this was where the serious study of international relations in India all began. The ICWA was set up by a small group of public intellectuals some years before our independence because they felt it important that India have an independent perspective on international affairs. Since then, the ICWA has gone from strength to strength and it has been a long journey, almost 75 years. One particular milestone in that journey was in 2001, when the Indian Parliament passed an act declaring the ICWA to be an institution of national importance. We thus became a publicly funded independent think tank. Our governing council is headed by the Vice President of India and the External Affairs Minister is its Vice President. We have three focus areas. The first is research, which is carried out by an in-house faculty. Very rigorous research of different parts of the world encompassing the domain of area studies. The Council has been very proactive in conducting dialogue and discussion on African affairs and India-Africa relations in order to promote an understanding on African affairs in India and Indian perspective on Africa, given the priority that now Africa has in Indian foreign policy. Within the Council, we have a renewed focus on Latin America and the Caribbean region. So we're looking through our studies to find new areas of cooperation, such as renewable energy, uh, climate change and the space technology. Interacting with leading experts, diplomats, media persons and academicians has helped me nurture my research further. We recently had the ASEAN Indo-Pacific Outlook which has a lot of convergence with the India's own uh, Indo-Pacific construct. The learning curve at the Council has been tremendous and it provides a strong foundation for my future research. The second is policy. Because we are a think tank, and being close to policy, commenting on policy and helping formulate policy is an essential part of our functioning. I think in the new age, what we're seeing much, much more of is that people want to be involved in foreign policy thinking. They want to have a voice. Now this is where ICWA comes in. This is the platform where I for many years have come and interacted with the, uh, with the best in the world. ICWA provides a valued platform for visiting foreign dignitaries to interact with informed Indian audiences. The third is outreach. This is most important because of our role as a public-funded independent think tank and we carry this out by associating ourselves with as wide an audience in India as is possible. Colleges, universities, other think tanks and of course with similar institutions elsewhere in the world what I would call the democratization of Indian foreign policy. That it has moved to distant corners of the country. It is no longer a preserve of Delhi. ICWA has a robust publications program, which includes papers by the in-house faculty, invited papers and commentaries, and books on foreign affairs by not only former diplomats and established academics, but also by upcoming scholars. Our journal, India Quarterly, is being published since 1945. ICWA's publications are also being translated into various Indian languages. What is ICWA's role as we move into the future? The vision of the institution is to stay abreast of all the momentous changes taking place in the domain of foreign policy. New areas are emerging. There are strategic technologies, there is climate change, there is artificial intelligence, and there is cyber security. How can our research faculty and the audiences that come here be better informed about developments in these areas? How can we write and formulate research papers to give policy inputs that help in government policy formulation? These are the emerging challenges for ICWA and form a part of our vision for the future.
ہیں Uh, sir, there is a, a small film which uh, is supposed to be torn uh, very quickly uh, about ICWA. So I am just requesting them to uh, start it. It is a very short 3-4 minutes film. Jeev, I think the film is over. Okay. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, uh, good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, this is Dr. Sanjeev Kumar, Research Fellow at Indian Council of World Affairs. I warmly welcome you all who have joined today's webinar from different parts of country and the world. As we are aware, on April 1, 1950, India established diplomatic relations with People's Republic of China. Congratulatory messages were exchanged between top leadership of both countries, India and China, on the occasion of 70th anniversary of diplomatic relations on April 1, 2020. If we examine 70 years of India-China relationship, in short, we can say that the relationship has witnessed breakthroughs as well as setbacks. This has set the stage for us at ICWA. ICWA seeks to mark this historic occasion by recapping the milestone, discussing complexities in the relationship, and analyzing future perspectives. Uh, let me brief you about today's program. Uh, today's web webinar will begin with remarks by Dr. T.C.A. Raghavan, uh, Director General ICWA, which will be followed by remarks by Chair and Moderator of the program, Dr. Sanjaya Varu. After that, three presentations by Ambassador Asok Kantha, by Mr. Dilip Chinoy and Professor Srikant Kondapalli. After that, there will be a Q&A moderated by Chair and the Chair will also conclude the session. We have a very distinguished panel today. I would like to very briefly introduce them. Dr. Sanjay Avaru is currently Distinguished Fellow at Manohar Parikar Institute of Defense Studies and Analysis and United Services Institute. He, he is former Secretary General of FICI and he has edited a number of financial newspapers, for example, Economic Times, Financial Express. He has also been a professor and he, his, his famous books are all known to us. Uh, now I come to panelist. Ambassador Asok Kantha is Director, Institute of Chinese Studies. He is a career diplomat and he was Secretary in Ministry of External Affairs. We all know that Prime Minister Narendra Modi made a very successful visit to China in May 2015 and Ambassador Asok Kantha was our ambassador to Beijing at that time. Our second speaker is Mr. Dilip Chinoy, he is currently Secretary General of FICI. Previously, he, he was MD and CEO of National Skill Corporation. He is recipient of a number of awards, including the Game Changer mm -hmm. Award and the Easy Achievers Award. And Professor Kondapalli, he is a well-known technologist and professor at JNU. He is recipient of K. Subramanyam Award and he is a frequent writer and his last book was on Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, significantly, he has also trained and groomed 
a number of young scholars in China studies. With this brief introduction, I would like to announce a house, a very important house rule that the all part participants and attendees are requested to go to live and ask questions through typing in chat box at their web page. These questions will be seen by the moderator and chair and he will ask, he will pose this question to the panelist. You are requested to be brief, to ask brief questions. And now I would like to request Director General ICWA, Dr. T.C. Raghavan to give his opening remarks or welcome remarks. But uh, let me also request uh, the Chair, Dr. Sanjay Avaru, to kindly conduct the proceedings now. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. May I begin by thanking the Chair and the panelists for of today's uh, session for finding the time uh, to join us uh, and uh, all of those who have logged in to, uh, to hear this discussion and to participate uh, uh, in it. Uh, as many of you are aware, uh, the ICWA has uh, a number of uh, partnership, partnerships with institutions uh, all across the world, of course, but also with a very large number of uh, educational and research uh, institutions in India. And we particularly take pride in the fact that very large number of graduate and undergraduate students regularly listen in to our web class and webinars and also participate uh, in our activities. Because of the pandemic, our physical activities have uh, been suspended as elsewhere. Uh, but uh, the, the web has provided a very useful uh, alternative uh, and therefore I am very grateful to the chairman, uh, to the chairperson and also each of the panelists for joining us uh, today. Uh, April 2020 is of course a very important milestone uh, in the diplomatic history of both China and India because it marks uh, the 70th anniversary of the establishment of diplomatic uh, relations. Uh, on the 1st of April, the leadership of both countries exchanged uh, felicitatory messages and in these messages what was emphasized also was the fact that although we have had formal modern diplomatic relations for 70 years, uh, in fact the India-China interface has a much longer uh, history and civilizational uh, content uh, to it. Uh, the Indian Council of World Affairs attaches a great deal of importance uh, to its partnerships with uh, counterpart organizations uh, in China. The fourth India-China Think Tanks Forum was held in uh, November-December 2019 and it is jointly organized by the Council and the Chinese Academy of Social uh, Sciences. The Council is also a participant in the India-China high-level segment on cultural and people-to-people -people exchanges and we also have a very vibrant relationship with the Chinese People's Institute of Foreign Affairs. And now under the ambit of each of these three umbrellas, a number of activities have been planned to mark the 70th anniversary of uh, this uh, diplomatic uh, relationship. Because of the pandemic, some of these events will now require to be uh, changed. But we thought we would start the process by uh, having discussions of this kind. Uh, and I would like to reiterate that this is by no means the first uh, discuss such discussion which we would be having on China-India relations. And we hope to come out with a schedule uh, of these in the near uh, future. Before I hand over to the chair, I would like to uh, share one observation. There is a great deal of comment of informed comment, I should say, about uh, the precise impact of this uh, global uh, pandemic. It is very evidently a geopolitical event of great uh, significance. So far, we can only speculate about the shape of things to come. Nobody is certain about the kind of world which will be there in one year, two years, or five years. But speculation is good in think tanks. 
And I would like to end on a note of uh, speculation, which is that just like 9-11 about 20 years ago, securitized international and global discourses, global narratives, and also global agendas, is it possible that this pandemic will start a shift in the other direction of desecuritization of uh, narratives? In particular, will non-traditional security now start occupying a larger part of our mental or political landscape? And if that happens, what will be the role of India and China in this desecuritized international uh, environment? This is a speculation which I uh, certainly have been thinking about personally. And I hope uh, that uh, some of the panelists will touch on this also. So with these introductory remarks, and once again extending my thanks to the chair, to the panelists, and to all of those who have joined today's session, I would now like to hand over to Professor Sanjay Mahdi. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Raghavan. Uh, I hope I'm audible to all of you. Um, I'm, I was informed that over 600 people have registered for this webinar this afternoon, which I think itself is an indication of the kind of interest uh, that any discussion on India-China relations uh, stimulates in India. Um, and certainly at this time, when we are marking the 70th anniversary, of this bilateral relationship. Uh, much is being written uh, in the media uh, on this relationship. And I'm sure uh, that our three very distinguished uh, speakers uh, bring a lot of uh, experience uh, and knowledge uh, of the bilateral relationship uh, to this discussion this afternoon. Um, Ambassador Raghavan has uh, raised an interesting question about the long-term implications of the current uh, global uh, coronavirus uh, epidemic, the pandemic, uh, in shaping uh, international relations. It is true, as he just now mentioned, that like 9-11, or indeed I would add uh, the 2008-2009 financial crisis, uh, global events which uh, some of us describe as black swans, unexpected events, whether it is the downing of the Twin Towers in New York, or the collapse of Lehman Brothers in September 2008, or the pandemic now. These are all black swan events, unpredictable, uh, but they have long-term consequences. They shape international relations. They uh, influence the pace of growth of different countries. Uh, they impose new burdens um, on governments. They offer new challenge, opportunities, etc. So therefore, for a long time to come, the current global context uh, will be discussed, uh, particularly in the context of India-China relations, uh, given China's uh, centrality uh, to the current pandemic. Um, at the same time, I think the India-China relationship also has another long-term dynamic, which um, often scholars refer to, which is that we are the oldest civilizations in some ways, the oldest continuing civilization. The Chinese civilization is indeed the oldest continuing civilization. Uh, India has had its moments of interruption, but nevertheless, <clears throat> there are two societies, two cultures, uh, which go back uh, several thousand years. Uh, we have the dominant economies of the world till uh, as recently as the 18th century. It's only in the last uh, 200, 300 years uh, that the West has uh, overtaken these two Asian giants. Uh, and both of us come with this long-term memory. Uh, you talk to people in China, you talk to our scholars here, uh, they are always influenced by the long-term memory of our uh, civilizational existence and uh, the relationship. But interestingly, uh, despite the fact that um, you know there has been, uh, for example, through Buddhism, a tremendous long-term cultural influence, the bilateral relationship uh, has gone through its ups and downs uh, as has been mentioned by the previous uh, speaker. And I think today's uh, discussion uh, would be interesting if we contextualize the current phase of the bilateral relationship within these larger um, you know, uh, frameworks, whether it's the you know, civilizational framework or the uh, global um, geoeconomic, geopolitical framework, um, because they're always there. I recall um, when uh, Prime Minister Manmohan Singh met Prime Minister Wen Jiabao 
uh, in 2004 or 5, uh, the two leaders said to each other that when we meet, the world, world looks at us. Uh, and that is true, that whenever India and China uh, come together, there is uh, tremendous interest around the world in the, in the relationship, whether the coming together is for good reasons or bad. But whatever the factors that bring the two countries together, there is um, not just uh, uh, bilateral interest, there is a regional interest, there is uh, a global interest in the relationship. And uh, as we go forward, uh, given the dynamics of globalization, the uh, kind of challenges that the Western economies are facing, uh, and the sustained rise of, of China, despite uh, all the ups and downs, we are looking at fundamental changes in what, what foreign policy analysts would call balance of power uh, in, in, a, in a global context. So there are a lot of issues that come up. We have, I'm afraid, uh, less than about two hours in front of us, sorry, less than an hour and a half in front of us uh, to discuss these. So what I would request our three distinguished speakers is to draw attention to what they regard as key issues, key bilateral issues, key regional issues, key global challenges, key, key economic challenges, uh, so that we put on the table what we regard as important issues and, um, and, and, and how each of our speakers would, would, would look at these issues. Um, finally, I'd like to say that um, the uh, bilateral relationship of India and China is such, uh, as I said, because of its implications for the world, uh, is such that it is shaped by other other countries. For example, um, needless to mention, Pakistan is a country that has played a role in in in, in some ways shaping our bilateral relationship. Uh, similarly, the United States has played its role in shaping our relationship, uh, and therefore, I think there are other players in the world. Uh, who have their own interests in, in, in shaping our bilateral relationship. And I think it will be interesting to uh, take, uh, take cognizance of all these factors. With these initial remarks, I don't want to spend more time speaking because, as we all know, we are very learned speakers. I will begin with uh, my friend Ambassador Ashok Kanta. He's already been mentioned. He's had a long, distinguished career in uh, Indian diplomatic service, but most importantly, he was our ambassador to China and is now head of the Institute for Chinese Studies uh, in New Delhi. Uh, Ashok. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Sanjay. Uh, let me you know, thank uh, Dr. Raghavan and other colleagues from ICWA for inviting me to participate in this important webinar and webinar which is being very well attended. Now, as uh, Dr. Sanjay Pal mentioned, uh, you know, on 1st April, leaders of India and China exchanged messages to mark the 70th anniversary of the establishing diplomatic relations between the two countries. Uh, uh, 70 activities were uh, planned uh, to celebrate the 70th anniversary, but these could not be taken up uh, due to the outbreak of COVID. Uh, that pandemic, uh, let's hope that they will revive as many of these activities as uh, soon as possible once the COVID situation is brought under control. We are, you know, friends, uh, looking at the India at 70 in the context of 70th anniversary of establishment of diplomatic relations. But as uh, both uh, uh, Dr. Raghavan and Dr. Baru mentioned, uh, India-China relations are much older. Civilizational dimension of this relationship is extremely important and which continues to shape the contours of this relationship. But if we just look at the shorter period of 70 years, uh, it has been, as Sanjeev mentioned, a period of ups and downs. From soaring hopes and the deep disappointment of the 1950s and early 1960s to the virtual freeze in the relations post-1962 border conflict, to the resumption of ambassadorial level diplomatic ties in 1976 and the establishment of a pragmatic paradigm of engagement during Prime Minister Rajiv Gandhi's visit to China in December 1988, when the two sides agreed to move towards normal relations without letting the boundary question and, and other outstanding issues come in the way. Uh, this basic paradigm of engagement has served us well in the last three decades. Uh, it's a pragmatic approach which has characterized India's China policy despite changes in government. And that's important that in the last three decades, there have been several changes in 
government in Delhi, but the basic approach, the basic template, the basic paradigm of our China policy has not changed. Let me make you know three quick points here. One, uh, management of India-China relations is predicated on the recognition of the fact that it's a difficult and complicated relationship which requires a mature and sensitive handling. The scorecard is on the whole positive. I would like to highlight this because this, this is something which is often not acknowledged. We have, for instance, an unresolved boundary question, but the border areas are peaceful, notwithstanding occasional face-off situations. In, in, indeed, you know, India-China borders are far more peaceful than India-Pakistan borders and uh, LAC, even though the latter is well-defined. Uh, we have put in place uh, all attributes of normal state-to-state -state relations between India and China. It's now a highly diversified relationship with a major economic component. The two countries work together on a whole lot of multilateral and global issues and fora. The second point I would like to mention is that uh, the guidance of India-China relations has been a leaders-led process. Uh, and this has been the case for the last you know, three decades plus. At present, in fact, uh, uh, this has been taken to a new level with uh, Prime Minister Narendra Modi and President Xi Jinping virtually taking charge of the relationship. We have seen you know, two informal summits at Wuhan and Mamlapuram and institutionalization of informal summits. Though at present, we don't know when the third uh, informal summit will take. Uh, that depends on, you know, are getting, getting some kind of control on the COVID situation uh, within the next few months. The third point I would like to make is that uh, while progress has been made and good progress has been made in management of India-China relations, we now need a new or updated paradigm for managing relations more so in the post-COVID world. Existing template, even though it has served us well, needs to be updated because it's inadequate. Now, uh, let me briefly explain why I'm suggesting that. You know, structural challenges in the relationship have accumulated. Uh, there are a whole lot of outstanding issues ranging from the boundary question to trade imbalance, uh, India and China overlapping footprints in their shared periphery, and we don't know how exactly to manage that, that aspect. Uh, there are doubts in two countries about each other's strategic uh, ambitions. There are different worldviews. Uh, for instance, we are not quite on the same page about what kind of future we see for Asia-Pacific region or for the world. Uh, neither side, in fact, is really happy with the state of relations. Are uh, not enough, uh, you know, uh, we, 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 we are trying to manage uh, relations with China, uh, and that's important, but that's not enough. What we need is also to deal with outstanding issues. Uh, we have to contend with a new and assertive China, an aspiring new India, and a new and changed international situation. And here, let me you know, briefly respond to the point Dr. Raghavan referred to. We are indeed in a new territory. Uh, COVID-19 uh, is a geopolitical event of immense significance, which at the least has greatly accelerated trends and tendencies which were very, very much in evidence earlier. We don't know yet whether it will be a phase changer, whether it will be a new era, but it will make a huge impact, there's no doubt about it, even though the outcomes are still uncertain. Qualitatively, we'll be in a new international situation uh, post-COVID. For one thing, we can be fairly certain that there will be intensification of U.S.-China strategic rivalry and progressive economic decoupling between the U.S.A. and China. That will become the new normal and it will have big implications for India-China relations. We will come under greater pressure from both the U.S.A. and China to take sides in the emerging strategic rivalry between the two countries. Post-COVID, we are also likely to see a more assertive China. In fact, uh, one can argue that uh, after global economic crisis 2008-9, China saw an opening for itself, which it seized, and it sees another opening for itself, and we may expect China to try to play a much larger role, and that will mean more conflict with the USA in terms of in the context of their strategic rivalry. Yet, I expect China to reach out to neighboring countries, including India, 
as it seeks to deal with its principal challenge of dealing with, China, with the USA and counter the growing backlash to its assertive behavior and the so-called wolf warrior diplomacy. When China is under pressure, it's more inclined to reach out to India as we have seen in the past. But it's doubtful that its flexibility will extend to China accommodating India's substantive concerns. Now, how do we look at the new paradigm of relationship that I'm referring to, that I'm suggesting should be defined? What can be elements of the new paradigm? One can only speculate at this point of time because, as you know, Dr. Raghavan mentioned, uh, we are in uncertain period. The larger geopolitical context to India-China relationship is still sh taking shape, but one can identify some possible elements of the new, pa new, new paradigm uh, to govern India-China relations. One, we must manage differences properly. We should not allow differences to degenerate into disputes as Prime Minister Modi and President Xi Jinping have agreed. But it will not be enough to manage differences. We must achieve at least limited progress in, achieve in addressing outstanding issues, whether it's the boundary question or trade deficit and whole lot of other issues which have piled up. Two, we must add fresh content to India-China relations. I think it's extremely important in this relationship and that has been my own personal experience as well that we can't stand still in managing this this relationship. We have to keep adding new content all the time. We have to show greater ambition in reimagining India-China relations. For instance, how do we substantiate closer developmental partnership under the scenario of disruptions the global value chains in the post-COVID world? Can we look at cooperation in development of and manufacturing of COVID vaccine, for instance, just to give you an example. The third element of the new template will have to address the simultaneous rise of China and India as two major powers. Can the two countries do so mindful of each other's interests, concerns and aspirations? How do they manage their overlapping footprints in the periphery, land and maritime? How do they deal with doubts about each other's strategic ambitions? These are some of the big issues that need to be addressed through much closer strategic consultations, leading to a new modus vivendi between India and China. The routine foreign office consultations in which we engage in would not suffice. Uh, there's no easy answer to find to these questions, but it should be possible through closer consultations to evolve understanding progressively on specific issues and theatres. The fourth element of the new paradigm is the need to develop a new agenda of working together on regional multilateral issues in the post-COVID world. The existing consensus has frayed, even areas where we worked closely in the past, for instance, climate change. Uh, as two major developing and emerging economies, the scope of India-China relations has gone well beyond bilateral relations. We have broad converging interests and face common challenges in Asia and beyond. There are also divergent perspectives on many issues. Much, there is much space for strategic coordination and cooperation on regional global issues, proceeding from shared interests and concerns. But there is need to devise a new agenda. The existing agenda is already outdated. The new agenda must focus on specific issues, uh, which could be, for instance, public health in context of pandemics. It could be e-commerce. It could be transborder movement of data. It could be developing a new paradigm for globalization in a deglobalizing world. It could be strengthening of multilateral institutions at a time when the existing institutions have proved to be grossly inadequate in addressing the challenge of COVID-19 pandemic, for instance. The final point I would like to make is that uh, perceptions about China and India have turned somewhat more negative post-COVID. This is also brought out in, a, in a, an online survey which was conducted uh, late March, early April, where 67% of respondents felt that China was somehow to blame for, for the COVID-19 pandemic. But uh, this survey also brought out that there is continuing consensus in India on broad policy of constructive engagement with China and avoiding the trap of adversarial engagement. 
our you know cooperation and competition will coexist with changing mix and that mix is uncertain there are concerns about china's assertive policies and attitude of china towards the rise of india and its aspirations these concerns are quite widespread in india therefore along with constructive engagement they will also be hedging and balancing more so given the vast asymmetry in india's capabilities vis-a-vis -vis china and i suspect that this imbalance will become even starker in post covid world that will make our task of dealing with china more difficult indeed i'll conclude by saying that it, the terrain the ter territory the context for managing india china relations will become more complicated in the post covid world i'll conclude here thank you very much uh, ambassador ashok kanta i think you covered all the key issues as far as the bilateral relationship is concerned and very interesting set of uh, agenda, very interesting agenda for you know taking the relationship forward particularly in the current context i'm sure we'll come back to some of these issues uh, let me now turn to uh, my friend dilip chinoy who is now secretary general of the federation of indian chambers of commerce and industry and uh, fiki has been um, in the center of a national debate in this country uh, on uh, india's own trade policy for example on the membership of the regional comprehensive economic partnership agreement uh whether the that that was something in the interests of indian uh, business or not and clearly china's uh, policy with respect to trade was a very important factor um i'm going to also re request uh, mr chinoy uh to give his own thoughts or the thoughts of of the members of his organization uh, with respect to the bilateral economic relationship how they see this uh, taking for, forward in the current context what are the opportunities the challenges uh, that uh, china presents uh, as far as the indian business and industry is concerned i think for uh, more all indians in fact our audience today and for generally all those who take an interest in international issues it's very very important to always remember uh, that while we talk about each other as civilizational neighbors as the world's largest nations were, over a billion people population uh, the fact is that china today is five times as big as india in terms of its economic size uh, in terms of per capita income and, and national income uh, in the last two decades the phenomenal growth of china um, has uh, created both challenges and opportunities and china is india's biggest trade partner uh, as a consequence of its own rise as as a major economy uh, so i now invite uh, mr chinoy uh, to reflect on these and any other issues uh, that he regards as important for the bilateral relationship uh, thank you uh, dr sanjay baru um, actually it's a honor and privilege uh, to me uh, to be here uh, uh, it's a really distinguished uh, set of speakers and ambassador ashok kantha uh, professor kondapalli and uh, ambassador ragwan also sanjeev um as it was mentioned that the year 2020 holds uh, a special significance for india and china relations 70 years of diplomatic ties and i think uh, the 70 years was also to celebrate uh, not only our diplomatic relations but also to foster economic uh, ties and it was also reemphasized as was mentioned at the recent uh, summit but if you look at uh, uh, you know what ambassador uh, kantha said um, you know there were five uh, there were uh, uh, there are five key factors in the india china relationship and each one actually has a very interesting economic dimension so you know when we talk about people people to people and cultural exchanges one of the key things is you know indian movies uh, and you know succeeding in china and you know the relationship that uh, uh, you know uh, bollywood or indian cinema has with the chinese uh, people of course it does bring in a lot of revenue etc uh, to uh, uh, to the indian film industry in and also it was mentioned by uh, master ashok kantha about the multicultural multi uh, uh, lateral cooperation But of course there are two specific areas that india and china Uh, are there other than the G20, uh, which are the BRICS and the SCO? 
And interestingly, the discussions and the cooperation under these frameworks have been progressing at a very uh, interesting uh, pace and a lot of new innovative ideas are coming out as a contrast to what uh, Dr. Baru mentioned was the RCEP uh, discussions and I'll come to that, uh, uh, right? We are also then therefore, uh, you know, with the G20 being uh, in India, we are working on, you know, uh, economic agenda for, for uh, getting some deliverables uh, at that time. So, of course, India and China will have to work together uh, in promoting the business agenda in these multilateral forums. And, of, and this whole anti-globalization uh, trend, which was mentioned, may have an impact on that. The third area is, you know, the whole thing of building state and provincial uh, contact, whether it's Gujarat and the province in China or West Bengal. And they are actually uh, doing a whole new set of economic relationships and investment. And the diversity of China and India provincial e uh, economies actually is happening very quietly and very steadily, um, uh, despite all the noise that you hear. The fourth area is the new economy startups and innovation ecosystem. And there, you know, China has invested in Indian unicorns such as Paytm, Oyo, uh, and uh, therefore, you know, you'll see uh, a lot of other investments in uh, Indian uh, startup ecosystem, uh, which uh, really uh, yeah, makes it relevant for the Indian policymakers to have a fine balance between creating a friendly, open, and predictable, predictable investment environment on one hand, and safeguarding a longer-term strategic interest. You know, for example, the changing of the automatic clearance of FDI, which was done uh, recently. The fifth area is the balanced and diversified economic partnership, and which is the main focus of my intervention uh, today. As uh, Dr. Baru and as the speakers mentioned earlier, that we, you know China is one of the largest trading partners, uh, with, you know, with a huge rise in our bilateral trade. And it was mentioned earlier that India's trade deficit with uh, China is perceived as not sustainable. And you know, how do you actually both sides take initiatives to? Uh, you know, bridge the deficit and increase uh, confidence. But at the same time, in the manufacturing sector, Chinese uh, companies are uh, already invested uh, very, very uh, strongly in uh, India. They are uh, very close to, uh, you know, uh, more than 1,000 companies have in increased their investment in industrial parks, e-commerce, and other areas with over 200,000 local uh, jobs uh, created. The, uh, in, uh, the, the, the total investment, uh, which was 1.6 billion in 2014, uh, which was then at the time mostly by state controlled enterprises, it's actually gone up to 5.8 billion in 2019. Similarly, it is coming from private firms. Uh, similarly, Indian companies like Tata's and Mahindra and Dr. Reddy's and a whole host of them are also present in China. Investment till September uh, of last year was uh, about point, uh, Nine to a billion, and this could be greatly enhanced to increase market access and a diversified outlook. So the problem here is that a lot of Indian companies say that they don't have market access in China, and China has a greater access, uh, market access in India. Can there be some uh, e equality? Now, in the current scenario, and I want to spend a little more time here. There have been some dramatic shifts in perception. So if you look at earlier. The perception was that uh, India did not have enough market access uh, in India. There were non-tariff barriers created against exports out of India. Uh, there was unfair competition, uh, and uh, there was overcapacity in certain sectors in China, which is leading to other consequences for the Indian uh, economy. And um, you know, when the COVID first came up in end January, early February. The impact in India was very interesting. You see, it was the first time a lot of sectors actually realized their dependence on the supply chains from China. There was a fear that disruption of the supply chain of uh, active pharmaceutical ingredients in the pharmaceutical sector would actually uh, you know, cripple the ability of Indian pharmaceutical uh, sector to produce medicines in India. The entire solar, uh, uh, you know, whether it's the solar modules or the, uh, the renewable energy sector was the second uh, such sector. 
The third sector was chemicals, the special uh, specialty chemicals. The garmenting industry had a lot of you know uh, other uh, stuff coming in, like buttons and zippers and all coming in from there. So sector, there were 30, 30 sectors that were identified which actually were impacted. And if you look at India's exports, I'll just give you one example. 25% of India's shrimp exports went to China, and that was blocked. So the interdependence of the two economies came out starkly in just before the uh, the the the, uh, the uh, COVID-19 hit India, and at that point of time, a decision was taken to actually ban exports of protective equipment, masks, etc., to, to China, which actually led to a certain amount of friction. And then bilaterally, it was resolved. The export bans was uh, uh, were lifted. Now the the shoe is actually on the other foot. We are importing uh, masks and you know other equipment from China, and I think you know the ambassador uh, uh, Victor Mishri is doing a great job in in, in 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 enabling that to happen. But again, the first thing was you know substandard equipment coming in, uh, uh, predatory pricing. So in this whole fi another set of economic issues actually uh, came up uh, from there, and uh, you know we have actually resolved them. Uh, similarly, you know, in uh, in in the current situation where the Chinese economy has restarted and the Indian economy has not yet restarted in areas like steel, chemicals, and many many other sectors now, the, in, uh, there is a fear that because the Chinese demand is not yet coming up, although they expected, you know, some predictions say that they expected to grow one percent this year and nine percent next year, and as Dr. Baru said. The size of the economies is hugely different, so it's a huge difference in growth. We should not just go on the on the percentages. So the fear is that a lot of uh, excess, uh, uh, you know, uh, products from China would be dumped there, and India would have to protect itself. So there's a new dimension to the trade uh, kind of of uh, 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 issues. In another sense, a lot of people are now looking at uh, getting supply chains uh, controlled domestically, whether it is a, you know, Japan's uh, $22 billion package to get uh, supply chains back or other countries. And even India is looking at uh, APIs to come in. Is this uh, going to further increase tension or like uh, Ambassador Kanta said, is it going to be an opportunity to work together uh, to actually I said this is something which uh, needs to be actually explored uh, going forward. So if you look at, you know, Chinese investment, majority of it going out to Vietnam, very little to India. What does India need to do to get that investment? Can we build a relationship uh, that actually skews the, uh, and, you know, turns the, uh, reduces the trade deficit? And uh, we are a little more comfortable in dealing with each other in the economic context. And even if the RCEP was actually, you know, uh, kind of opposed because of the uncertainty of the impact between India, China trade and, and, and the increase uh, in the trade deficit and its impact on small and medium companies uh, in India, uh, is it uh, possible that you know you can address the concerns of the sectors and create a new playbook and you know i uh, i think in the economic scenario of both china and india in the context of what's happening globally require a new playbook and you know like you like you mentioned earlier uh, it was mentioned that in the 18th century uh, both of us used to dominate uh, trade and the economic activity is it possible to do it uh, in the 21st century uh, going forward so I think this new uh, playbook uh, has to be built on trust, has to be built on openness, uh, has to be built, you know, we have many uh, areas of, uh, you know, di uh, many areas where we do dialogues, whether it is the uh, State Council and Niti Aayog, or it is the Strategic Economic Dialogue, or the Financial Dialogue, or the China-India Joint Working Group, or the new uh, group set up under the Finance Minister. So we have a lot of bilateral groups to actually uh, do this, and we need to sit and discuss uh, there and ensure that uh, you know whatever uh, happens in China and India, our relationship actually grows because uh, China being a large e economy and India being a large economy, this partnership has to succeed if we have to uh, you know address the challenges of. Uh, post uh, covid world so we you know i i think i would just uh, like to end uh, here and uh, you know maybe take on uh, more questions uh, uh, in the future so thank you uh, sanjay for that and back to you 
Thank you very much, uh, Dilip. I think uh, the, the new issues that have been coming up in the recent past, which you mentioned, are all very interesting. They will continue to, uh, you know, matter uh, in terms of the bilateral relations. I'm sure in in into the near future, um, and there are many complicated issues. For example, uh, you know, if you want to reduce the trade deficit. Um, one way of reducing the trade deficit is to increase Chinese investments in India. But there have been concerns in India about increased Chinese investment. Um, you know, so uh, a solution to one problem uh, can result in uh, uh, another problem. So it's a very complex terrain that we have uh, as far as the bilateral economic relations are concerned. Uh, but I'm sure um, there will be a lot of questions on, on these issues. Let me turn now. I mean, we've had two excellent bilateral of summing up of the bilateral relationship uh, with uh, Ashok Kanta looking at the um, you know, border issue, the political relations between the two countries, and uh, Dilip uh, focusing on the economic issues. Um, let, me, let us go beyond the bilateral into regional and multilateral issues. We have an eminent professor of international um, policy, uh, international affairs, um, Dr. Srikant Kondapalli from the Jawaharlal Nehru University. Um, and I, Shrikant, I would like you to, um, you know, also look at how the bilateral relationship between India and China will be impacted by uh, China's own relations with our neighbors, our relations with China's neighbors. I mean, whether it's uh, in the uh, South Asian context, uh, our immediate neighborhood, or the wider neighborhood of uh, East Asia, Southeast Asia, what we call the Indo-Pacific or indeed uh, West Asia, uh, how China has developed its relations around uh, Asia has had in, uh, serious uh, implications for uh, the bilateral relationship. One of the things that is on top of the mind for most Indians is the China-Pakistan relationship. But there are other relationships that keep coming up. Similarly, the Chinese have uh, you know, cl close interest in our relations with uh, East Asian economies, with Japan, with Taiwan, uh, and, and other countries in the region. So I, I was hoping that you would um, you know, bring your knowledge to bear on looking at some of these wider issues uh, that impact the bilateral relationship. Thank you very much, and uh, a good afternoon to you. Am I audible? Yeah, now you're audible. Uh, a very good afternoon to you all. Um, let me thank the ICWA for giving me this opportunity and to the chair for raising those uh, regional and global issues which are very relevant for discussion during the 70th anniversary of India-China relations, diplomatic establishment of these relations. Uh, I think at the uh, four levels, there is a certain uh, disruption uh, that the India-China relations need to factor in. Uh, one, uh, the first disruption is, as the previous speaker spoke about, with the uh, COVID-19 and the production lines, uh, trade value chains getting disrupted. Um, uh, we have seen that disruption since the 2008 uh, global financial crisis, or before that, the 1997 Asian financial crisis. Uh, not so much during the 97, but uh, 2008 definitely, uh, and uh, also the uh, 2000, uh, the current uh, COVID-19. Uh, the expectations uh, uh, from different agencies are that we're going to see actually a depressed uh, economy uh, across the region uh, in Asia as well as at the global level. The WTO uh, assessed that there will be a double-digit decrease in the trade volume um, in this year, in 2020. Uh, this will result in, obviously, manufacturing sector, electronics especially, and automotive products um, uh, suffering a lot. Uh, secondly, you have also the services trade um, that will be problematic because of the restrictions on transportation networks and travel. Um, for instance, we are heavily dependent on services, and this is going to be a major problem. And China is dependent more on manufacturing sector, and so they will have huge issues on this front. Um, uh, so the, in order to address the COVID-19 as well as 
the globalization uh, issues. There has been the G20 uh, meeting, virtual meeting, on March 26th, uh, where Prime Minister Modi, President Xi Jinping addressed this meeting uh, along with the other G20 members. Uh, um, where else can you discuss those issues other than G20? Uh, but the kind of flavor that has been added is uh, in relation to a WHO-led, World Health Organization-led uh, epidemic control um, in terms of emergencies, in, in terms of uh, um, you know health uh, ministerial meeting proposals, which we have done during the SARS, SARC meeting just before um, the Eurasian Medical Officers meeting, online meeting that has been conducted. So there were also, of course, proposals on cutting tariffs, uh, opening up the barriers for trade uh, in the G20 proposals. And uh, Prime Minister Modi mentioned about the new globalization that is required uh, in order to re uh, suggest to a, uh, an addressing of the COVID-19 related issues. So from uh, the disruption in trade and investments, uh, this is going to be a major uh, impact uh, to address Ambassador Raghavan's uh, question on what would be the post-COVID world. Uh, this is a major one. Of course, by next year, many estimates suggest to rebounding in China, India, or in other economies. Uh, uh, but nevertheless, the one of the operating principles in bilateral relations between India and China is uh, in the joint statements, they specifically mention, for example, growth is mutually reinforcing rather than leading to competition. So I think from this point of view, a coordination is necessary uh, between China and India uh, in a futuristic setup uh, uh, as far as the, uh, the disruption in trade investments, market mechanisms are concerned, number one. Number two is the disruption in technologies uh, which is not bad because we will have new technologies which would look for more um, uh, more capacity buildup, uh, etc. For example, in 5G uh, uh, or artificial intelligence, uh, unmanned aerial vehicles, uh, which could also provide for the medical uh, support during the contagious uh, diseases. Uh, 3D printing. In, uh, in again, uh, various applications during COVID-19 outbreak. Uh, Internet of Things, uh, general, uh, uh, you know, uh, or space programs in which there is a lot that could be uh, looked at. These are all disruptions in trade, uh, in technologies, um, because they would try, like to replace the 4G, they would like to replace various other previous technologies. So to that extent, uh, this disruption is useful, uh, but nevertheless, there is also one feature that is uh, Huawei uh, suggesting that the 5G of it should be uh, should be adopted uh, by various countries. Um, uh, UK, Germany, France, uh, other European countries are under pressure on the 5G related. We were also under pressure. Uh, for example, uh, 5G has been accepted for their trials this January. Uh, although Airtel is going towards Nokia and Geo is going towards uh, Samsung in order to get the 5G networks. Um, uh, but there are also other areas where we could possibly see some friction points that need to be obviously addressed. And this includes the, the import substitution policies that China is going to adopt uh, once the Made in China 2025 uh, is going to be uh, in place by 2025 because something like 80% of the products will be procured from the domestic market uh, and outside products will be kind of discriminated. Al already we have some discrimination as uh, Mr. Chinoy has mentioned on Indian products. So this would probably add up to the, uh, to the burden some uh, aspect. Um, uh, in the joint statements as well between India and China, this phrase frequently comes up. A partnership is a factor in stability. Uh, India-China partnership, which has now been termed as developmental partnership. Uh, so that is one where we could possibly try to address the technological disruptions or the other disruptions which are in place. Uh, then you have also the disruptions caused by terrorism, uh, in which we have uh, some, in, some institutions 
or committees like the 1267 committee or 1357 committee or other uh, United Nations Security Council led committees uh, in which we have seen actually a lot of differences between India and China on issues which are closer to their national security aspects. The Chinese suggest to the three evils, separatism, extremism and splitism, while India mentions about cross-border terrorism as a major challenge. And in the light of the Handwana uh, attacks uh, a few days ago, day before yesterday, I think this issue is still a major uh, component in the India-China relations. That needs uh, a lot more push. Uh, uh, what we have seen in the last 20 years is not enough, and so there is a need for uh, pushing that angle as well. The fourth disruption is in the Asian stability levels, uh, regional levels, and this is where we see, uh, for instance, the perceptions related to each other is getting, uh, you know, uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, um, in, a, in a very differentiated manner. As Dr. Baru mentioned about uh, terrorism, uh, India-Pakistan relations, uh, uh, or the Chinese looking at U.S.-India relations. Uh, but the fact of the matter is in Asian region, there is a quiet uh, uh, change in the stability patterns. We have seen South China Sea militarization. Uh, we have seen uh, the East China Sea becoming now uh, militarized. The Japanese have mentioned, for instance, over 621 transgressions uh, on the Senkaku Islands by the Chinese Coast Guard and the Air Force. So a new disruption, which we also see, as the Indian Navy chief mentioned about the submarine visits by China in the Indian Ocean region. So, uh, so in other words, these are areas that are becoming uh, uh, again and again uh, areas to be looked at uh, from a disruptive uh, point of view on the stability aspects. Um, so in the light of this, the regional and global aspects, uh, we have actually been doing better. Um, in November 2006, during Hu Jintao's visit to New Delhi, Dr. Manmohan Singh and uh, Hu Jintao uh, have uh, mentioned that they will start looking at <clears throat> the Asian region. Uh, this is the first time in India-China joint declarations. Uh, anything um, above South Asia have been mentioned. Uh, and since then, there have been some structured dialogues. Uh, for instance, in 2013, we had a dialogue in Central Asia, on Central Asia, uh, on energy issues, terrorism, uh, economic issues, and so on. Uh, then we also had... Uh, the uh, dialogue on Afghanistan, because we both will be uh, facing problems, India and China will be facing problems once the ISAF withdraws from Afghanistan. So there have been some uh, statements on Afghan-led, Afghan-owned initiative uh, or the major, uh, other initiatives that has come up. And this is important in the light of the U.S.-Taliban uh, deal in Qatar recently. Uh, on a possible transition in Afghanistan. We have also a third dialogue in uh, Southeast Asia on Southeast Asian issues uh, and on maritime issues. We have a, for instance, a, uh, a dialogue process on maritime 2016-2018 um, where we try to discuss on the maritime issues. So at the regional level, we have uh, a lot of things going on uh, between India and China. At the global level, as Dr. Baru had mentioned, there is some coordination in the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, in the United Nations, in the BRICS, uh, in um, climate change proposals as part of the basic format, Brazil, South Africa, India, China format. So at the global institutions, global level, uh, we have uh, two main agendas in terms of multipolarity and multilateralism uh, in which we have been able to coordinate on various issues like uh, uh, on Iran, on Iraq, on uh, North Korea, on Syria, Libya, um, uh, or other issues. So this has been one format where, uh, however, we also have an issue here. For instance, uh, China has been blocking the NSG membership of India, Nuclear Supplies Group, uh, uh, in which China wants Pakistan to be a part of that, uh, while the Indian side has been suggesting to look at the uh, clean 
we were clean record on the WMD proliferation. Uh, so those are some also friction points. Uh, also, China is the only P5 country which doesn't explicitly uh, support the Indian candidature in the Security Council membership. The 2009 formulation at Ekaterinburg on support to the uh, participation in international institutions, uh, that doesn't really come closer to the Security Council membership. So China is a lone man uh, in the P5 uh, not to explicitly support the Indian candidature. So there is again a problematic area in that international institution. Although in the United Nations there is so much of coordination between the two. Uh, to sum up, I would suggest to uh, the uh, what should be the future trajectory in terms of the 70 years and beyond. The balance sheet appears to be the focus more on power, the focus more on uh, reciprocity issues, uh, and there is uh, also uh, there is too much emphasis on bilateral relations, but uh, the bilateral issues have not been uh, resolved. Uh, so this suggests there is a new thinking necessary on that aspect. Uh, the November 2006 joint statement between Hu Jintao and Manmohan Singh uh, does have elements of working together in the regional and global context, but this has also been devoid of any uh, uh, any uh, fresh blood. Uh, so, so such interaction has also become very uh, uh, problematic by various counts. Um, thirdly, I think uh, there is a need for India and China to look at and coordinate, cooperate in emerging issues such as global commons, uh, for instance, in maritime issues, in cyber domain, in space domain, where there are new challenges that are coming up uh, in terms of cybersecurity, in terms of space-based warfare or others. And so there is a necessity again to come at, to discuss these global commons related aspects. Um, we did see the Indian side coming closer to the Indo-Pacific Quad and others. Um, uh, and Prime Minister Modi did suggest in the Shangri-La Dialogue uh, in June 2018 about the inclusivity aspect of the Indo-Pacific from an Indian perspective. Uh, so it does uh, um, lead to some, uh, you know, um, accommodative attitude towards China. Uh, yet on the maritime issues, there are several concerns. South China Sea, Indian Ocean being the primary ones, but there could also be others where trade and other interests could become uh, major issues of concern. Finally, I would say that there is um, uh, the the um, the kind of power transition that is happening at the U.S.-China levels uh, in the recent times uh, uh, that would. We have seen, for, ex for example, the Trump administration has taken various measures like the Asian Reassurance Initiative Act or the uh, the Uyghur Bill or uh, uh, various others, uh, which suggests then, uh, and again on the COVID-19 as well, there are sharp uh, uh, you know differences. We have to see whether these are only U.S. elections specific or a long-term uh, problems between U.S. and uh, China decoupling process. Uh, if so, then we also get caught in this um, in this aspect. For instance, on whether to call this as Chinese virus or Wuhan virus, uh, as Wang Yi asked uh, External Affairs Minister Jay Shankar in the phone talk, whether what should be the Indian response, etc. Uh, in this power transition, we would be coming again and again to look at those issues uh, related to China. So that adds up to um, a lot of issues in uh, post uh, uh, 70 years of celebration of diplomatic relations between the two. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Kundapalli. I think between the three of you, we have covered a whole range of issues. I have been monitoring the chat on my uh, computer to see the number of questions, or lots of questions. Uh, from participants uh, in this discussion. Um, what We have about half an hour in front of us. So what I will do is to actually summarize these questions and give each one of you the opportunity to respond to some of them, including a couple of my own questions. Uh, it occurred to me that uh, three issues that uh, we did not, um, not, you know, the three or four interventions we've had. Incidentally, I'd be quite happy to welcome Dr. Raghavan also to chip in 
uh, in case he would like to on any of these questions. Um, three issues which did not really get enough attention. Uh, one, of course, is something that does not in general get much attention uh, in India-China relations, which is people-to-people -people contact. I mean, the number of Indian students in China, the number of Indian businessmen in China, or the number of Chinese in India. Um, I, you know, from the media, one doesn't often un understand how much uh, to and fro there has been. Uh, when the COVID crisis uh, hit the headlines, uh, we realized the number of students living in Wuhan and studying there. So how important are growing people-to-people -people relations, whether it is students, tourists, businessmen, uh, and how are these, uh, how the people-to-people -people relations likely to uh, influence the bilateral relationship? Because often when we talk of bi bilateral relations, we look at government-to-government -government relations or business-to-business -business relations. But there's a third dimension, which is people to people. And maybe Ambassador Ashok Kanta can, can focus on that. A second set of issues that... Uh, I think to put it you know, in a summer, sum, summary fashion, there are two kinds of questions that have been posed by participants. One is um, what kind of cooperation is possible post-COVID between India and China, vaccine development, pharmaceuticals, healthcare, etc. But the other is what should India be doing uh, to, in a sense, uh, question China's uh, uh, role in this, its uh, responsibility, uh, you know, the international community has been very critical of the Chinese. Um, you know, what should our position be? So there are a whole lot of COVID-related uh, questions. And um, whether, you know, for example, if the U.S.-China relationship becomes worse because of uh, heightened uh, in, uh, you know, concern in the U.S. on COVID, uh, how would that impact India relationship? So the, the, those are the kind of questions. I mean, I've been reading through all these on my computer screen. So I'm trying to summarize them because one can't go uh, individual by individual. Let me um, once again go in the same order and invite the three of you uh, to reflect on these or any others. In fact, let me begin with uh, Raghavan in case you would like to come in having heard the three speakers and these questions, if you have any observations. I'd like to thank, thank uh, Sanjay and also thank Atlas so very, very uh, interesting and comprehensive observations. I was scrolling through the list of questions and uh, I found that there were two or three uh, very pointed questions uh, which had been touched on in each of the interventions, but perhaps uh, these particular participants wanted a little more uh, detail. Uh, these pointed questions were on firstly the question of uh, quote unquote trade, trade dependency and the second was uh, I think addressed to uh, Mr. Chinoy which is on uh, investment opportunities which you mentioned uh, and also it says that you had mentioned trade dependency but what about investment but also the question of opportunistic takeovers by Chinese entities and there has been some reporting in the media uh, about this following certain regulatory changes. So some brief comments by the panelists would be very interesting. Thank you. Yes, uh, Ambassador Ashok Kant. Can you turn on his mic, please? I think your mic is not on. Yes, can Audio? you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, now we can hear you. Yes. You know, a number of questions have been raised. I will not try to answer all of them. 
uh, beginning with uh, people to people contacts you know this is an extremely important dimension of india china engagement to which uh, the, the current leadership in both countries you know prime minister modi and president xi have attached great deal of importance and this is one area where a lot of progress has taken place uh, for instance you know tourism uh, when i was in peking at that time we decided to start giving e tourist visa to chinese nationals and the number of you know a uh, tourist uh, arriving in india from china and china from india has gone up to 1 million still a small number but not insignificant but areas where we have seen really significant breakthroughs are you know number one indian films indian films are now mainstream in chinese uh, moving a uh, chinese you know uh, uh, box office uh, which is the second largest in world next only to the usa and for indian movies china has emerged as a very major market and this is this is something which will which is going to continue with us uh number 2 yoga yoga is really household you know there are literally millions of yoga followers in china and numbers are growing uh number 3 indian students in china i remember when i was a young diplomat in in peking in 1980s we had just about half a dozen indian students in china now we have something like 25000 indian students in china and this fact came across to us very clearly during the wuhan i uh, you know when we had to airlift students from wuhan so this is one area uh, where uh, contacts have been uh, hugely disrupted as a result of covid-19 we'll have to work out a careful plan of action to resume restart these contacts but this dimension is important for various reasons including the way these contacts take perceptions in china about india and india about china apart from you know service service uh, uh, service sector trade for instance which is important this is one a uh, second point i would like to you know take on is uh, this whole aspect of whole issue of uh, china's culpability in outbreak of covid-19 and what kind of role india should play now this is now a mainstream concern uh, let's you know acknowledge that this is not something uh, which is happening only because of you know upcoming elections in usa though that's a contributing factor uh, these concerns have been articulated elsewhere as well including europe in in uh, in japan in australia uh, apart from usa i think government of india has done well by not taking a position in this blame game but i think it's china's interest also to see that uh, the question of origin of covid-19 is investigated thoroughly because this is something given the scale of this pandemic i think you owe it to all of us that we understand why the novel coronavirus uh, uh, emerged in china uh, why it became a pandemic over a period of time and kind of devastation it has wrought in terms of humanitarian damage in terms of you know uh, uh, impact on economy etc so this is one issue i think uh, uh, needs to be discussed and debated even though government of india has rightly not taken a position uh, in the blame game which is unfolding between china and usa in particular a third aspect you know i would like to you know uh, uh, briefly touch upon is you know us china relations and its impact on india china relations uh, i have no doubt about it that uh, we have a new normal when it comes to a strategic rivalry between the usa and china and uh, this situation will get aggravated this rivalry will get intensified no matter whether donald trump is reelected as president in the usa or we have joe biden as the new president i think there is a fundamental shift in how the usa looks at china how china looks at uh, us china relations and it will have impact uh, in terms of changing the larger geopolitical context in which we will pursue india china relations we'll come under much greater pressure from both usa and china to take sides but it will also open up new space for us in fact for china dealing with usa will be the principal preoccupation and as i mentioned in my initial remarks it might be a little more flexible in terms of reaching out to its neighbors including india i'll conclude here 
Thank you, uh, Ashok. Dilip, you heard that specific question from uh, Dr. Raghavan, uh, you know, pertaining to Chinese investments in India and concerns here uh, about the changes in government policy. Uh, there are also quest specific questions on the pharma sector, uh, the dependence of Indian companies on API, uh, and um, you know what what does uh, in Indian industry uh, what is it likely to uh, do in future to reduce this dependence? Um, you know what kind of policy measures would Fiki, for example, be recommending? Uh, in dealing with, with this whole problem of, of pharma sector, uh, both market access for Indian exports as well as India's dependence on Chinese um, APIs. The third question, Dilip, um, is about um, the whole issue of uh, uh, funding post-COVID development and whether you see a role for the Asian Infrastructure Bank, the BRICS National Development Bank, in what way uh, do you think the Chinese funding could come in uh, or has the COVID situation weakened China uh, as far as external uh, aid and external support is concerned? Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, so uh, let me actually, I was also looking at the chat boxes and I thank uh, everybody for the questions. Um, you know, when I was uh, addressing, I did touch upon the changes in the FTI uh, rules and regulations uh, to prevent, uh, you know, takeover by people, countries that have a land border with uh, with India. And a lot of people actually uh, looked at it, uh, you know, uh, as it is directed to China. And I think the 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 challenge here was that uh, if Indian company share prices are kind of uh, uh, going down and because of the SEBI regulations, since the annual results are not yet declared and the companies can't buy back their shares, then what is the protection currently for Indian companies uh, to ensure that they maintain ownership of their uh, assets, right? So uh, that was one step that was actually uh, taken. And then the second step was taken that you could actually do E, AGMs, et cetera, et cetera, so that uh, window becomes uh, shorter. There is a genuine, uh, actually, concern, not only in India, but across the world, you know, at this stage, will, uh, you know, uh, uh, economic activity be promoted by the state to actually to get ownership of uh, critical assets uh, around the world. And therefore, most uh, countries and in India also have actually started taking action uh, against uh, that. But somehow, when you look at it, the challenge is how to treat Hong Kong, because most of the fund managers are based in Hong Kong, and they're not necessarily Chinese money. So I think, you know, a special window, uh, you know, is, is being carved out for the fund managers, etc., from uh, from Hong Kong uh, to enable that uh, to happen. I think the, the opportunistic takeover is not good for either uh, businesses uh, in India or for the country uh, as such, and even for global, global economic uh, stability. And I think you will see some action by many more countries in this uh, regard. The second uh, point that actually uh, you know was raised uh, was this trade dependency uh, between India and China and the pharma uh, sector. And uh, uh, Sanjay Baro, you, uh, you specifically asked what Fiki's uh, point in this is. So over the last uh, six months, actually, uh, Fiki has been working uh, on this initiative. And the first was, you know, since at that point of time, nobody even dreamt of a negative price of oil on any particular day. But, you know, everybody believed that given the that then price of oil, electronic imports are going to overtake the imports of oil. So how do you actually make India into a electronics manufacturing hub? And how do you get, you know, investment from uh, what is actually happening in China to India? And a whole series of uh, recommendations are given about phase manufacturing program in mobiles, a specific mobile initiative, which has actually resulted in a in a huge uh, uptake of production of mobile phones uh, in India. Although a lot of components were dependent on China, the next stage is to actually manufacture those components uh, in India. 
during the post uh, the covid uh, 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 you know period uh, fiki had put forward a proposal on attracting api investments into india and the government has actually come up with a with a plan to set up api parks uh, in india and get indian companies to manufacture apis uh, in india and it has a lot of fiscal uh, benefits uh, there and the challenge uh, here is that you know in, in critical drugs do we have the ability to have end to end in the value chain so that if there's a disruption you know you're not left with uh, gaps in the value chain and you can't meet domestic uh, health needs you will actually see health investment across the world increasing and more countries wanting to be self reliant in this uh, post covid the third uh, issue that was actually raised was you know uh, this trade relationship and how do we go forward and someone said you know how can you build trust uh, in this relationship i think uh, the uh, this is really some initiatives that uh, uh, chinese business and chinese government need to take to bridge the trust deficit uh, to become you know more transparent uh, you know it, it's a very complicated and and deep rooted issue because you know even now what the fear is that you know one sector learns that oh chinese government is giving an 8% uh, you know export subsidy uh, to uh, countries exporting so can you increase the duties in india by 15% so you know there's this whole issue of what the what china would do to increase its exports or what they would do to prevent Uh, i think uh, professor also mentioned about their made in china 2025 and their domestic uh, procurement policy will that um, you know cut off indian exports uh, to china and further deepen the uh, the you know, trade deficit so i think the trust uh, it's a two way game but i think a lot of the onus is on chinese business and chinese government uh, to uh, you know uh, have a more transparent accounting system have more transparent processes and systems so that uh, it's not actually uh, felt otherwise in india the third uh, question was this uh, yeah, the asian infrastructure uh, you know bank and the new uh, development bank actually what is very interesting is that during the time of the brics in november last year in brazil uh, it was it was actually stated that you know ndb will be opening its india operations and you know we will be starting to look at specific uh, projects uh, infrastructure related product projects and other projects in india but uh, i think the timing coincided with covid so uh, I, i i see that maybe it's may be delayed by 2 uh, to 3 months or 4 months but this will actually happen uh, maybe the the office has already quietly been opened and we are, we are going to wait uh, for an announcement uh, uh, there i think there was also a question of you know what does uh, Uh, you know, will india uh, be able to be an alternate uh, to uh, china i think uh, one of the things that uh, is happening is that countries are looking as an alternate source right and there is a lot you know fiki has been in dialogue with government to look at how to make india an attractive destination for uh, these products and specific papers and specific discussions are being prepared you might have read of a lot of that in the media but you know how do how do we enable india to become uh, an alternate source uh, to uh, to china would uh, chinese investments uh, or let's say firms that are investing in china uh, relocate to india uh you know actually what is happening is that if you if you look at even the japanese package out of the 22 billion only 200 billion is uh, 200 million is uh, is is uh, allocated for you know japanese investors looking at a third uh, country but that also is qualified by it being through the asean region but all the rest of the 22 billion is only attracting the investment back to japan so most of the countries in the first step are saying how can you attract you know investment back to your country and then look at it uh, going forward and you know look at an alternate source only after that so i think i've answered all the questions uh, dr baru i don't know if i've left out uh, anyone yeah we are run also running out of time so let me give the uh, shrikant uh, his opportunity you have had a lot of questions srikant looks like some of your students are uh, in this discussion i can see 
to people from around the country asking questions specifically to you. Um, I think one issue which um, you may wish to address is the how do you see the Asian security architecture uh, going forward, um, the relationship between India, China and, and Asian region as a whole. And uh, secondly, on this whole issue of, um, um, you know, what you yourself mentioned, uh, disruption. Um, if you like, I mean, after 62, um, apart from minor issues be between then and now, we've had a long period of stability uh, in the relationship, India-China relationship. Um, are you suggesting going forward uh, for a variety of reasons, the various disruptions you've talked about, we are looking at a period of some instability in the bilateral relationship, whether it's to do with uh, um, terrorism in the region, whether it's to do with Afghanistan, whether it's to do with South China Sea, whether it's to do with um, declining U.S. kind of influence or presence in Asia. You know, a variety of factors. Are we looking at a more uh, unstable future um, as opposed to a relatively stable past? Your mic, uh, your mic. Um, yeah, well. uh, unfortunately, I didn't see any of my students there, so let me be more free uh, okay. to address. Um, the one that was raised in the beginning, uh, that is Krishna Mohan Reddy from uh, uh, on U.S. and India-China relations. Uh, I remember uh, Dr. Baru raising this in the first round itself. Um, uh, I think it is uh, United States is a very central uh, player in the India-China relations. Although India and China have acquired uh, huge dimensions with uh, population, territory, power, uh, you know, location, geopolitical location, and uh, various other things. As Condoleezza Rice used to say about India, uh, Indian position during 2005 uh, events. Um, uh, having said that, the uh, U.S. is becoming a major player in India-China relations. 1971, you had uh, Kissinger visiting China, China-Pakistan-U.S. kind of axis, where you have also the India-Soviet Union, you know, kind of treaty. Uh, that was the first time that continued uh, between China and the U.S. till the uh, uh, 1998 nuclear test where they passed the 1172 resolution in the Security Council uh, resolution. Um, of course, the uh, 123 agreement has, you know, tilted the balance between the two. Uh, uh, we have seen the uh, India-U.S. relations improving, um, and the uh, Bush administration took uh, the policies to improve relations with India. Uh, however, during Obama administration, we have also seen during 2009 joint statement with uh, Hu Jintao, there was a mention about the South Asian security aspects to be taken care of by the U.S. and China. That did rile the Indian side on this issue. Uh, so the Chinese have played the American card, uh, and today they are saying, you know, the U.S. should not play, uh, the, the Indians should not play the U.S. card. So I think there is a kind of problem there in this uh, U.S. role on the uh, in the India-China relations. Um, uh, we are looking for uh, uh, India is looking for those aspects. Uh, uh, for example, China has always termed India as a, a major country in South Asia. They have a, a confinement towards the South Asian region and club up with Pakistan and you know various other things. And with the Belt and Road uh, Initiative and CPEC projects, uh, that kind of thinking process continues in the Chinese uh, Chinese strategy. So to that extent, I think there is the uh, U.S. role that has been conducive for India, and there has been a lot of debate in India on this on this count. So uh, U.S. has become a major uh, kind of uh, player in the India-China relations. Um, of course, today the Chinese object to the third-party role uh, in the bilateral relations, although they played that role before. Uh, on the issue of uh, um, uh, Belt and Road Initiative that was raised, uh, um, uh, I think the Indian Prime Minister, Prime Minister Modi, had 
mentioned about the objection that India has on the China-Pakistan economic corridor, which Premier Li Keqiang mentioned as the flagship program of the BRI, Belt and Road Initiative. So Prime Minister Modi raised this in Raisina Dialogue. He raised this in Qingtao Shanghai Cooperation Organization preliminary meeting in June 2018. Uh, he had raised in various other fora. Uh, and so far, there has not been any uh, Chinese uh, you know, uh, revision of the CPEC projects as of now. So that becomes still a contentious issue as far as India's position on the Belt and Road Initiative is mentioned. The Ministry of External Affairs spokesman mentioned four reasons why India has some issues on Belt and Road Initiative. Number one, on the sovereignty aspect, that is the CPEC, which passes through the Kashmir territory uh, in Gilgit, Baltistan and uh, 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 Pakistan-occupied Kashmir region. Number two, on transparency. Number three, on financial uh, uh, sound financing, etc. Uh, because if, uh, uh, if uh, like Maldives have complained about the island grab by China, uh, as Mr. Nasheed has mentioned, uh, then India has to chip in, India has to provide uh, aid for these countries. So there is also the the uh, um, blowback of the BRI projects in the Indian neighborhood. We could probably see the same thing in Nepal. We have been seeing that in Sri Lanka after Sri Lanka was not able to pay back for the Hambantota project uh, um, uh, issue. So so this is a problem for, uh, for the Indian side. The fourth issue that uh, MEA spokesperson has mentioned is related to the uh, the the transparency aspects as well in the BRI projects. So, um, in other words, these have become uh, problematic in India-China relations, and we have not seen any uh, revision in China's position on the BRI. Of course, in a post-COVID uh, period, we probably will see some reassessments in China because uh, many, uh, uh, many countries today, their GDP is down. Uh, so, in terms of infrastructure projects, if these are not really useful at this point of time, uh, if they are willing to forego some of their assets uh, for the highly indebted countries like uh, Tajikistan, Mongolia, like uh, Sri Lanka or uh, other countries, Pakistan included. Uh, so this is a thing that we need to see in a post-COVID-19 world order. Uh, on the last uh, question that was raised on disruption and the instability that is created um, uh, in uh, Asia and beyond and its impact on bilateral relations between India and China. I think this is a very um, uncertain uh, 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 you know, factor for the bilateral relations in terms of its future trajectory. Um, of course, both have their own national interests, both they have their own uh, you know, uh, dreams and ideas. Um, uh, one of the major disruptions that has happened is the 19th Communist Party Congress resolution suggesting that um, uh, jettisoning the project of uh, keeping a low profile to that of uh, achieving, accomplishing something. Um, some of the issues such as uh, China wants to occupy the center stage um, or the, um, uh, you know, various Asian related initiatives that China had undertaken, it did create a lot of instability. For example, on South China Sea, as we discussed, uh, or on Indian Ocean region. Uh, so, so this has created some kind of a tension in the bilateral relations, not just for India, of course. It's between US-China, it is between China-Japan, it's between China-Southeast Asian countries where a code of conduct is being uh, pushed through. Uh, uh, so it has been a uh, relatively a universal phenomenon. European Union countries are also complaining, uh, Australia as well. So to that extent, I think this instability is not just for India-China relations. So to that extent, this becomes a factor that India needs to consider actively and look for um, like-minded countries in the world. Thank you, uh, Dr. Kondapalli. I think we have come to the end of our time. Uh, I don't want to take any more time in trying to summarize what has been said. I think we've had a fascinating um, one and a half hours uh, looking at the key issues uh, in the India-China relationship. 
I think it's often said that the two big, uh, two big issues that the leadership in both countries uh, have to address um, working together, uh, one is the trade deficit and the other is the trust deficit. And, uh, you know, what should be done uh, in order to be able to uh, handle the deficit in trade and trust uh, will determine in the short term uh, how the relationship evolves. Because both are, uh, I, in my judgment, essentially uh, short term uh, challenges, both the trade deficit challenge as well as the trust deficit challenge. In the long term, China and India are kind of countries that are bound to be uh, more important in world affairs. Um, but for us in India, the focus has to be internal, uh, uh, restoring momentum to our economy and to be able to uh, increase our own share of world, uh, world income and, and to ensure stability in the region. And to the extent that China can uh, cooperate with India in ensuring stability in the region, I think the many disruptions that Dr. Kundapalli referred to are very, very critical. Uh, India seeks stability, India seeks peace whether in West Asia, whether in Southeast Asia, whether in the Indo-Pacific, whether in the Indian Ocean, or whether across the border. Because for us, uh, as indeed was for China over the last 30, 40 years, that the economic development is the main challenge. And, and therefore, uh, whether it's the trust deficit or the trade deficit, uh, we will judge China's uh, intentions by seeing to what extent uh, it is able to uh, participate in India's own development and be a partner uh, in the abolition of poverty across Asia over the 21st century. With these uh, observations, let me hand over the, the, the mic to our hosts, Dr. Raghavan and Sanjeev Kumar. Thank you, sir. Uh, now, uh, let me <clears throat> let me thank the uh, Chair Dr. Sanjay Avaru and the uh, three distinguished panelists, uh, Mr. Asok Kantha, uh, Mr. Dilip Chinoy, and Professor Kondapalli for the wonderful discussion we had. I also thank uh, the DG ICWA, DDG, and JS for their guidance uh, of this program. And uh, finally, I, I sincerely thank all the people from different parts of country and the world who have logged in and uh, we, uh, the program is now complete and goodbye to everyone uh, till the, till we organize next meeting, next, next webinar uh, by ICWA. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Dr. Baru. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Stay safe. All of you. Thank you. Thank you, sir.